but a question that we received from a lot of different people on Twitter and via email was to get your thoughts about the passing of Hacksaw Butch Reed this past week. Well, and yeah, and I knew we were we were going to talk about this, and unfortunately, the one thing we forgot when we took three tries to record the experience a few days ago, we were supposed to let people know that we were going to talk about Butch Reed on this program, and we didn't do it. Um, so we will do that now. And it, what, how old was Butch? Was he 66, did they say? 66, yeah. Um, I'm going to say he broke in in Kansas City, right? Because he was from Kansas City, but he broke in the Central States Territory. I believe so. And I think that was probably, what, 1979, 80-ish, thereabouts? Maybe 78-ish, somewhere in there? Sounds right. The, the, the point is, he was good really quick. And... I'd never, I'd seen, you know, the newspaper clippings. First time I ever heard of him, he was working under his real name, Bruce Reed, in in the Kansas City Territory. And you could see by the the pictures that he was a, you know, big jacked up guy, but I had no frame of reference because there was really no home video then. And let's face it, the people in Kansas City in the late 70s weren't seeing fucking Kansas City wrestling on television. Um... But as soon as he got to Florida, which would have been what? Did he get there probably in 81 and then had a real good run in 82? 82, he was one of the highlights of Florida, yeah. Yeah, at right at that time. Now, that's when VHS and home video was in full bloom, and I started getting tapes of every territory. And all of a sudden, you see this guy that's maybe wrestled one or two other places, and you've barely heard of him before, and he's in the main events in Florida, which always had a lot of talent. And was fucking great. I mean, you could tell he was green then, but what an athlete and his matches were good and he had excitement to him and he was a baby face there. So he wasn't doing those real, you know, over the top heel promos that he'd do later on in in mid South, but he was still well-spoken and the same. He was sort of Ron Simmons always reminded everybody of a young Butch Reed. That's why we'll mention in a minute why they ended up getting, teamed up together because they wanted Butch as the veteran to try to help Ron along when he was an inexperienced guy. But anyway, uh, the Florida run was great. They already had him in with Flair for the world title and people were buying it. This is a guy that's barely been in the business for two years. Um, He was really a, a good baby face and you could tell he was as I said, he was green, but he was starting to smooth up. And during that run, you could even see improvement. And then I'm thinking, did he go straight from Florida to Mid-South? Because he was there when we got there. No, I think he went to Georgia first. That's right. Yeah. Uh, no, you know what? I think he was doing Georgia and a little Mid-South at the same time because he was in Mid-South in definitely by the fall of 83. And he and who was it? Pez Watley won the 83 tag team tournament and on Thanksgiving at the Omni. Well, he was in mid South in the spring of 83. That's when he got there as a baby face. And that's, I believe where he first became Butch Reed. He had been Bruce Reed up to that point. Yeah. And, and, and I can understand that because especially Watts is thinking, look at this fucking stud as he'd call him. Look at this hoss. Big football player, his name's Bruce. Bruce Reed sounds like the millionaire alter ego of a superhero, right? So Butch Reed, and then they added the Hacksaw, and they had uh, they had uh, him and Hacksaw Duggan feud over the Hacksaw name. Duggan was a heel when he first came in, right? That's and, right. And Butch was a babyface, and then they switched later on during the course of the year. But anyway, point I'm making is by the time... Really, his first main event spot's in 82 in Florida, but he's working with Flair. He's Eddie Graham was still alive. Kevin Sullivan was down there at the time. Dusty. He's learning from all these guys. Then he goes to Georgia and then to Mid-South and and gets to work with Bill Watts. And Watts was perfect to promote a guy like Butch Reed. And I think that's why he had his best run in the ring. I don't know financially, you know, but definitely his most critically acclaimed stuff was in Mid-South Wrestling. Because there, Bill Watts uh, was a college football player that turned pro wrestler. Butch Reed, college football player, turned pro wrestler. Boom, he's a fucking legitimate athlete and a tough guy because he also did rodeo and he, and he, you know, he's a legitimately badass guy. So he's perfect for Watts to push. 
And he was perfect for that territory because that's, you know, the kind of guys they bought. And, you know, a lot of people have said the reason why that 1984 business was so good was Watts' best year ever because the the smaller guys came in when they'd seen a steady diet of the Giants and the smaller guys that Rock and Roll and Midnight and Terry Taylor, T.A., the guys that could bump came in. But thing is, Butch was as big as the as the giants that were over in that territory, but he could fucking move like crazy. Remember how explosive he was and how quick, you know, he could get up and down and hit the football tackles and do the shit and take bumps too and throw the punches. You know, he was 260 or 270, but he moved a whole lot quicker and, and like a cat. So as much as the the crew that invaded from Tennessee, uh, you know, played a part in 84. Butch was huge. Even if not only the program with JYD, but then after dog left, Butch was still in the thick of it with doc and with Magnum and whoever the fuck, you and know, rem- was- and remember they said on TV, the reason the dog left was he couldn't, he couldn't deal with Butch Reed anymore. He right. was too scared of Butch Reed that he Butch couldn't Reed ran him out of town. Yeah. So, and, and I saw somebody on, uh, it may have been on PW Insider, might have been Mike Johnson, say, you know, it would have been great if Watts had just gone ahead and switched Butch Babyface to replace the dog instead of bringing in Master G, George Wells, and then trying with, I think, a snowman at one point, whatever the fuck. But the thing is, it may have helped New Orleans because we've talked about it. The loss of dog hurt New Orleans and New Orleans didn't recover, but for most of 1984, the rest of Mid South was dog free and did its record business ever, especially the Oklahoma end in Houston. So, I think it would have cost him money. People would have still taken it that uh, as obvious that they were they were trying to replace JYD with his arch rival Butch Reed. Um, it wasn't a thing where you could do the deal where when Ron Wright switched babyface when Whitey Caldwell got killed in a car wreck. And that that was an emotional, you know, heartstring tugging thing. Well, dog hadn't been killed. He just left for the WWF, right? So it, to have his hated rival suddenly take that spot, it would have been obvious. And Butch drew better as a heel the rest of that year than he had b- before it. And they still used him on top and into 85. And then they switched him babyface a year or so later. Um, well, no, he switched uh, towards the end of 84, didn't he? Because they did the thing where you were in a mask still and you sold Son of a bitch. That's right. That, that's right. That was Akbar. in November. Yeah. Well, we taped it in November. We were on the way out. We were doing the scaffold matches. I sold Hercules to Akbar. So they aired in December of that year. Point is, and he turned on Buddy, too, and fucking, because Buddy was trying to. Akbar was giving Buddy bribes and Rolex watches and things to try to get his his good friend Butch Reed to sign with Devastation Incorporated. When Butch found out about it, he knocked Buddy. Buddy took like 13 of the most ridiculous, unique bumps ever every time Butch would punch him. But anyway, it, later on, yes, he and Butch was great and uh, as a babyface there because people believed in him by then. And we've talked about when Brandy did that that one epiphany she had where she suddenly became one of the greatest promos in the business for five minutes that one week. She channeled Butch Reed in Mid South. It and just the whole flavor of the promotion, the style of the matches they had, the way that the guys that Watts liked to push and the way he liked to push them, Butch Reed was tailor made for that. And he was a great guy in the locker room too. When we first got there, we hadn't met a lot of these guys because Butch, Nikolai Volkov, uh, Crusher Darso, later on uh, Crusher Khrushchev, and later on Demolition. Um, Ernie Ladd, my God, I, you know, I'd seen Ernie Ladd wrestle, but I'd never got to meet him before. These guys had never worked the Tennessee territory and that's where most of us had been. Dennis knew a few people, but you know, we walked in not knowing anybody except the guys that came with us and all these guys are fucking giants. And, but uh, it it was the same kind of locker room. Everybody was joking around. It's just Nikolai was a 330 pound fucking kid. sewing everybody's fucking jacket sleeves together with his sewing kit and shit. And Butch was, he was fucking hilarious. He would ride your ass or he, if somebody was grumpy or cutting promos on somebody in the other locker room, they were going to do this. They were going to do it. Oh, you're selling wolf tickets again. You're selling wolf tickets on this. I know it sounds like I'm doing Ernie, 
Uh, but that was his favorite. You're selling wolf tickets, which means you're, you're crying wolf. You're promo in a fight. That's never going to fucking happen. You're crying wolf. Right. And when, when Watson Dundee put buddy Landell with Butch is kind of like the, the little buddy that was fucking cause Butch could go out there and blow V eight and cut that promo and fucking be badass. And then buddy could get even more heat than Butch by just that's right. Butch that's right. That's what, that's exactly what I said. And nodding his head, they were a great fucking pair. Um, I told you about the car wreck in Bunky, right? Should I tell that story again for the for the modern listeners? Tell it again. However many we've got, we don't even know these days. Um, we're we're gonna wrestle at night in Biloxi, Mississippi, at the Gulf Coast Coliseum, and that's a long way from Alexandria, Louisiana. That's a long fucking way. It's like two hundred and fifty miles. A lot of it's state highway. So me and the Midnight Express have left early and we've got out there and we're sitting in the locker room and apparently Butch Reed at the time lived in Baton Rouge, but he was in Alexandria, wherever they'd been the night before. Buddy was driving in his car and Butch was driving in his car and they were following each other from Alexandria, Louisiana, down over to Biloxi, Mississippi. And they're driving down the state road in Bunky. And... Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you how we found out. We're sitting in the locker room, all of the heels, and Dundee, the booker, walks in. He says, well, Budro and Butch won't be here tonight. What's the matter? They've had an accident. Who'd they hit? Each other. What? They ran into each other. Or more effectively, Butch ran into Buddy. Buddy Landell, I've told the story a million times, was the world's most distracted driver. You were taking your life in your hands anytime you got in a vehicle with him. And finally... Along about March of that year, I swore off riding, riding with Buddy because I was afraid we were going to get killed, and I started driving myself whenever it was his turn to drive. And Bobby and Dennis made about another two weeks, and then they quit too when they ended up in a fucking mud field covered in fucking dirt on the way to somewhere. So what had happened was Buddy was in front, Butch was behind, and they're going through downtown Bunky, Louisiana, which in those days was about three stoplights or whatever, and it's a two-lane road, and it's through the middle of this little town. And Buddy's doing the thing that Buddy does out in the front where he's looking out the window and whistling at the girls, and he's looking in the rearview mirror with his brush in one hand, brushing his hair just like Flair would do, except Flair wouldn't do it when he's driving. And somebody pulls out in front of Buddy and fucking hits the brakes for a stoplight. Well, Buddy's not paying any fucking attention, and at the last minute sees it and hits the brakes, but it's too late, and boom, he hits the, go- the car in front of him, and Butch is in behind Buddy, but since there was actually no warning because Buddy was just continuing on until he hit this car, he don't see until he's too late. And <laughs> I guess I can tell this story now. Butch, at the time, had been partaking of a substance that you would normally find in a small glass vial and dispensed with a small silver spoon. And that's what he'd been doing in his rearview mirror, which is another reason why he didn't see Buddy Landell come to a screeching halt in front of him. And bam, Butch Reed plows into the back of Buddy. Well, when that happens, Buddy's fucking head flies forward and he headbutts the goddamn steering wheel and busts himself open. And now he's bleeding. Now there's this three car pile up in downtown Bunky and Buddy fucking opens in. The woman in front is like, what the fuck? She sees Buddy Landell get out of the car. And I just, I think she's like, what the fuck is this going on? But Buddy wants to, to see if Butch is okay. So he goes back to Butch's car. Butch is, has his car door open and he's on his knees on the ground, leaning uh, in, in where he can get to the floorboard of his car, where he's trying to scrape up all of the cocaine that got spilled when it fucking went forward when he plowed into fucking Buddy. And Buddy leans in and he's going, I'm sorry, Butch. I'm sorry, Butch. And Butch looks up and says, Buddy, God damn it, get out of here. bleeding all over my shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so finally... They got all that shit scooped up before the cops got there, and it didn't take long because Bunky wasn't that big of a fucking town. So, but then their cars were fucked up, and there wasn't no way they were going to make it to Biloxi, so we had to do the fucking substitution and everything. But I think Buddy had taken, he might have taken another day off because he had to get stitches over that, but but that was the, 
that was the fucking great comeback to a fucking question ever asked in a dressing room. They've been in an accident. Who'd they hit? Each other. <laughs> I I said, did you know I saved Butch Reed's life one time? No. I had I had to take matters into my own hands physically when he was getting the shit kicked out of him. Had to come to his rescue. Oh, come on. I swear. <laughs> well, I swear this happened, but it wasn't like I just described it. So I hated to do run-ins in Mid-South because you couldn't smarten the cops up. So we had police to the ring and back when we were entering or exiting for our match. But if you had to do a run-in, you couldn't smarten the cops up. So you were on your own and you were hoping that you were going to get there before they fucking saw you, right? That's that story I told about Hercules Hernandez knocking that guy out for 20 minutes and hospitalizing him with an open-handed slap because he had tackled Herc on the way to the ring for a run-in. Well, one night in one of the Midnight Express matches, and I, it was somewhere or another, we were involved with Duggan. I think it might have been Duggan and the Fantastics against uh, the Midnight and somebody with me in the corner, whatever. I can't remember the specific match, but the point is Butch Reed had to do a run-in and hop on Duggan, right? So, God damn it, I'm up on the apron of the ring distracting the referee while there's a big six-way or whatever the fuck going on. You know what? It might have been just Terry Taylor and Duggan. Might have been a regular tag match. Think that's what it was. But anyway, there's the fucking four ways going on. I'm distracting the referee. Butch is going to come down the heel aisle and jump in and fucking glom Duggan, right? As he comes down the aisle and Butch was so athletic, he's running fast. He beat everybody. But by the time that they realized that he was coming down that aisle, he was already past them, except where he made his mistake was, I mean, he could do this, and it looked great when he did it. He would just dive and slide head first, like Pete Rose sliding into home base, but he'd dive under the bottom rope, slide into the ring with his momentum, and come to his feet in one motion. He was really athletic when he did it. Problem was, on this particular night, <laughs> when he fucking dove underneath the ri the rope, head first and tried to slide into the ring his fucking redneck from ringside he butch got by him but the redneck was right on his tail and he fucking tackled him and grabbed him right around the legs around the thighs and had him hooked and butch was on his stomach <laughs> underneath the bottom rope his top half was in the ring his crotch was on the apron and this guy had him wheelbarrow hooked uh, by both legs out on the floor and had the leverage on him. And Butch can't turn around because he's, you know, he's on his fucking belly and he's trying to reach back, but the guy, the guy's trying to pull him out of the ring. Well, fuck, it was up to me because the cops were lagging, right? I run down the apron of the ring and start fucking kicking the guy on the side of the head as hard as I can to get him to let go. And wham, I, I, the first one I got him good because he didn't know I was coming. And holy shit. He fucking sold that, but he still didn't let go of one leg. And now I'm trying to reach out and kick, and I don't want to fall off the goddamn ring. But I'm kicking him. Finally, the cops get there, a couple more kicks, and they drag him all the way off, and Butch gets in the ring and fucking does the finish. And then we all get back to the fucking locker room, and I was fucking, and the boys were laughing too, Bobby and Dennis, because they'd seen what was going on. And they're like, look at Cornus having to save Butch from this guy. So I told him afterward, I said, now, Butch, I said, I don't mind every once in a while, but don't make it a habit that I've got to bail you out of these situations and come to your rat, <laughs> save your ass, stand up for yourself. I, and he was dying laughing. Of course, I wouldn't have said that if he'd have thought I was serious or else he would have killed me. But we got for a couple of weeks, we, 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 everybody in the heel locker room got a halfway decent fucking chuckle out of Cornette having to save Butch Reed from the fucking marks. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but that, that was the thing, whether it was the, the football matches, watch like to do those with Butch and Doc and Duggan or the, the ghetto street fights, you couldn't do that today. Uh, but it worked for, for the people they wanted to see, and they would come in with the belts and the spurs and the boots and there'd be blood and it looked like a, you know, a, I guess they don't have too many spurs in the ghetto, but, uh. And that's another thing. Butch was a rodeo guy too, which he actually did after he got out of the wrestling business. That's what one more run that I was associated with him was when they brought him into WCW and what 
89 or into 90, 89. He came in in 89, early yeah. 89. Yeah. The rumor was yeah. he was going to be in the horseman. Um, and you know, I, I honestly, at that point in time, that probably would have worked. I know that flair was a big fan. I don't know. I don't know if flair, if flair wasn't the booker when he came in, the committee had brought him in, I believe. Cause Jr. was a big fan of butch Reeds. Um, I don't know whether, whether it was Flair's idea to put him in the horseman or that was one of the committee ideas, but they wanted to do something with him. And I don't, I, I think they didn't actually present him as, as best as they could. And that's why when Flair took the book, he decided to put him and Simmons uh, under the hoods as doom. And I even said, I said, isn't everybody, go, who else looks like that? How the fuck is anybody not going to know who this is? But it made them, it made them look like they belong together. And instead of, because not many people, especially on a national basis, knew Ron Simmons at that time. And as I mentioned, that's the one thing that Rick had mentioned and Kevin Sullivan had mentioned. They talked to Butch about, you know, help Ron. You've got more experience. You guys, similar backgrounds with football and Florida, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Ron was able to learn a lot there from, from teaming up with a, a guy that had more experience. But then when they dropped the masks... They didn't have to use Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. They could still just use Doom. It worked anyway. They looked great together. And, you know, I, I think they had a great run there. But then uh, think about this. Butch was born in, because he was 66, he was born in like 1955. In 82 in Florida, he's 27 years old. Wow, what shape he's in. In 84, 85 in Mid-South, he's 30 years old. And that's his, you know, best work. By the time he'd gone to the, had the run in WWF, you can't hold that against him because everybody fucking, everybody's quality of performance fell in a hole up there. Um, whether it was the schedule or whether it was just the fact that they didn't really care about the matches, uh, most of the guys at that point, everybody gained weight, everybody slowed down. Um, the Doom run was the best, the last best run of his career. And they had great matches with the Steiners and everybody else. But at that point, in the early 90s, now Ron's almost 40. Or Ron, not Ron, but Butch is almost 40. And his knees had been bad since before Mid-South. And I think that's there was no territories to work anymore. He'd been to the one place, what didn't really like it. He'd had a good run in the other place, and... There wasn't much left to do. I think at that point he, you know, that's when he decided to do the rodeo thing. But I, re I remember when we first got to Louisiana, and Dennis Condry had kind of a sarcastic sense of humor. But we watched Butch one time getting dressed, putting his knees on, putting his knee braces, uh, the wraps of the knees, and then the tape of the knee, and then the knee braces. And finally, Dennis said, "Fuck, Butch! If you go any further, it's going to look like you got polio." And then Butch <laughs> gave him. I know Butch gave because that's the way the guys talk to each other back then. But Butch gave him a look like, "Hey, motherfucker!" And just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just ribbing. I'm just ribbing. But he, they were bad then. So, I just a, a lot of guys had bad knees coming from a football background. So, I think by the you know by the early '90s he had probably, uh, even if there were territories, he had done his best stuff in the ring at that point. But I, I you know. I always liked him. Got a kick out of him. Fucking promos day, promo days. He was hilarious. He could turn that shit on and off. When we'd be sitting there at Channel Three in Shreveport, uh, doing the local promos for all the mid south towns, it was the the most reliable guys. Obviously, were JYD when he was there because he could talk. But Duggan was an all star. Buddy Landell, Butch Reed, and then you know uh, me and and. And, and Magnum TA, he didn't have the fucking promos that would just have us rolling in the aisles, but he got pretty consistent then. But most all the top guys could talk and, and they, you know, they'd pop you. And and Butch was great to fucking listen to. So I, I really liked him. I hate that I, I guess he wasn't in bad health for a long time. Did I hear he just had recently had a couple of heart attacks and then boom, that was it. Yeah, that's what I had heard as well. But, uh, you know, and and he's another guy that a lot of people are overlooking because they saw him in with the bleach blonde gimmick in the WWF in what eighty eight, 
and the uh, 86, okay. 87, 80, 88. Whatever. Yeah, the natural. Thank you. Thank you, you savant. Uh, the natural. I said the natural. Dustin was the natural and Butch was the natural. Uh, but anyway, it, it, go back and look at the Mid South stuff. To try to find some of the Florida stuff. Mid South is probably easier. The Houston Arena matches. You know, Butch Reed could go and a lot more. Uh, di- as a matter of fact, didn't uh, it was even on Twitter? Old Powerhouse Hobbs, Will Ho- Willie Hobbs, as they called him over on AEW. Um, somebody had made mention that Butch had had good things to say about Hobbs, and that's is the same kind of fucking guy, raw talent, big guy, but with a lot of explosiveness. And so I think Butch saw some of himself in in Hobbs. We'll see if that works out for him. But that's that's who some of these guys like Hobbs and et cetera ought to be watching tapes up to to see how to fucking make an impact and have people taking you fucking seriously. Fantastic in Mid South. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get that version of Butch Reed in WWF. I wish we had had Butch Reed in UWF in '86 when Watts went national. He would have been amazing on that roster with everyone there. But he had been burned out on that schedule. Imagine being burned out oh. on the Mid South schedule. And then going to work for the going WWF. To the w- <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, somebody said that's why he ended up. Um, he didn't. He didn't no show and and just quit like Steve Armstrong did when the mirror cracked. He just woke up in the hotel room that morning and said, "Fuck it, I'm going home." <laughs> um, but he had no showed some days, and then they they cooled off on him, and then he was more underneath, and then finally he got burnt and said, "I ah, fuck it," and that was kind of it. But yeah, going for the. I can't imagine. Besides the NWA champion, and let's say from 1982 to 1987, besides the NWA champion or somebody that was on the road constantly for the WWF, I can't imagine a worse travel territory situation to be in than than Mid South and and or the early UWF expansion when they were covering even a, a bigger area. Uh, that it was just it was well, DiBiase said one time that first real good main event top run he had in, in the mid South territory, he had worked for McGurk and he'd worked Louisiana, et cetera. But the first main event run for Watts, he was there for a year and a half. His hair started falling out and he hated the wrestling business and he didn't want the money anymore. He just had to fuck. And he went to Georgia where he wouldn't have to drive longer than 180 miles. Uh, you had to get out of there every once in a while, or you'd go out of your fucking mind. Well, sometimes when people go out of their minds, they look to sue. Who's sending me to all these towns? Who's sending me to Bogalusa? Well, who can I I'll, sue? I'll guarantee you it's not Sue. Sue didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't even there. But I'll tell you what, if you, if you want legal representation, whether you are damaged by a major corporation or a greedy, avaricious company, or whether you've been persecuted by slanderous lawsuits by alleged perverts more on that in the weeks to come folks i know the guy that you should be calling call steven the rest you know i'm gonna go ahead and say it right now we have made arrangements we're gonna be having steven on the experience i believe well one of these programs in about a week or so but i'm gonna go ahead and say this now in addition to all the other things he's done whether it be for the cancer ridden town in west virginia or the 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 senior citizens that were victimized at the nursing home or the the various uh folks that were given cancer by chemicals they didn't even know they were ingesting but now steven has another case involved in the wrestling business uh he is involved in the situation with poor pelly primo who has been sued for what 15 million dollars by uh by the penis party fella um and basically the penis party fellow, and I'll let Steven tell it in a few weeks in more details, but the penis party fellow has been trying to sue everybody that's 
told what they know about him to uh to basically make them shut up so that he can continue on with the things that he was doing before and Stephen p new has stepped in because i don't know about you brian but it came as a surprise to me that pelly primo does not have 15 million dollars laying around and that's what this guy's trying to do he's trying to cause everybody to have to file bankruptcy and ruin their credit and etc cetera, etc cetera. and to add insult to injury this idiot was trying to sue Pelly Primo in in California, where Pelly's never been, just because it'd be closer for Penis Boy. So Stephen P. New was able to step in and get that case moved to Pennsylvania, where Pelly resides. And now, Pelly has a, as a matter of fact, has opened up a, a a legal defense fund that he's asking people to contribute to, not for Stephen, who is interacting as best he can, but for council that is uh how what do they call it admitted or licensed in the particular jurisdiction that the lawsuit is in now and etc we're gonna have more details on this but if you want somebody to help you out if you've been victimized by somebody even a guy known for having a penis call stephen p new at newlawoffice.com 888-692-8084 he can help you out and he's on the side of the little guy I'm not saying he does everything for free, but he'll he'll cut you a break every now and then. You know, I understand why the penis pervert's upset that people spoke out and told their stories about him. But considering that he allegedly has found religion, shouldn't he just forgive everyone? Well, no, because if you find religion, the first thing that they teach you is that they want money. Because God is all-powerful, but he's horrible at handling money. What's the first thing every religion wants is money. That's what the penis pervert wants, is money. He's already got a default judgment against one of these outlaw wrestlers that doesn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of and is trying to ruin their credit. So he knows he ain't going to get any money. He just wants to persecute people. Well, Stephen P. New don't like people being persecuted, and he personally persecutes the persecutors. 888-692-8084, newlawoffice.com.